Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we explore the future and what this means for your leadership. We ask the big questions. What's happening on the horizon? What does this mean for us? And most importantly, what skills do I need now for leadership of the future? It's time to explore. Let's go. Hey there, it's Zoe Routh, your friendly neighborhood Canadian Australian podcast host, author, and general nice person. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. If you're the first time listener, hey, awesome that you're here. And your return listener, thank you for creating time and space for me to be in your ears yet again this week. Lots going on on Planet Human. And What's interesting is a bit of reflection on Planet Human. I've been reading or listening to the audiobook of Mary Beard, SPQR, The History of Ancient Rome. Don't ask me to say what SPQR stands for. It's Latin for the Republic of Rome. <laughs> oh, those who know what that is actually will just be rolling their eyes in frustration. In any case, it is one of the definitive histories of ancient Rome, and she's an awesome writer. Why am I telling you this? Because... As I listen to the 2,000-year history of Rome and its impact on modern day, I realize that in the past, as humans, we have definitely mistreated each other. We've savaged each other. We've conducted genocide. We've oppressed people. We've turned people into slaves. This is all Roman stuff. And yet, it is in community and communion that we have driven our own evolution as a species. Things are actually better now. And we've managed to survive these little plague-ridden eras of domination and autocracy and egoism and power struggles. Despite all those flares of that malevolence, we are actually in a better place. And we still have a lot of people committed to improving the world and improving the lot of humans and improving the lot of all sentient beings on this beautiful planet, this one little green and blue blob we call Earth. And that gives me hope. A lot of the research I've been doing for my next book, my next nonfiction book, Power Games, has left me a little deflated because it, we tend to lean in a little bit more into the downsides of being human. And yet, and yet, there is hope and things are actually getting better and things have improved since 2000 years ago. <laughs> So hopefully they will continue to improve, but it takes vigilance and it takes courage from leaders like you to continue to make wise and compassionate decisions. All right. So that was a fairly serious introduction to what is a really fascinating conversation. And my question for you today is, how do you turn something like 9-11, speaking of things that are not so great, into a useful experience and something that is great? My guest today is Elias Canaris. He is one of the founding partners of Conscious Leadership Team. He is an expert in resilience, leadership, and building trust. And he had quite an extraordinary experience on that fateful day on September 9-11. I'm trying to read it backwards. Out there. November 9th. No, September 11th duh, in 2001, all the way back there in New York. He was on his way to New York and things changed for him. So without further ado... Actually, there is further ado. We are going to hear from Elias in just a moment. I wanted to tell you about Planet Zoe. Duh. <laughs> I forgot about that part. Uh, see, I'm all jumbled up today. I gave you a little cue there. I'm focused on Power Games, which is my next nonfiction book. I'm drilling into what happens at workplaces when we play these power games and how can we navigate that. So if you want to contribute to that research, They'll be, send me an email if you want to share your story. I'd love to read it. I would also love to share some of the fantastic book reviews I've been getting for my most recent novel, Olympus Bound. And in, with the idea to help prompt you to pick up a copy, either a paperback from Amazon or my own website or the ebook through Amazon. So this is from Kim Katanzerite. She is a fellow author and she says, I have enjoyed all of this author's work, but in Olympus Bound... Zoe has really hit her stride. This is a story that immerses you immediately. Wonderful writing, deep dives into intriguing characters, and action, action, action. I love this book and can't wait for the next one. Thank you, Kim. That's high praise indeed. She's also an editor and coaches people how to write. 
And this is from Lori Peterson, also on Goodreads. She says, the grand sequel to The Olympus Project has come, dot, dot, dot. And author Zoe Routh absolutely keeps elevating her ability to weave poignant, realistic stories. Highly recommended. Thank you, Lori. And why do I want you to read fiction? It's not a distraction. It's actually purposeful learning. It's a way to immerse yourself in a world and to experience the challenges that these characters have without actually putting yourself in danger, like going to the moon. And you get to learn vicariously through their experiences. I think it's one of the best ways to experience leadership in concentrated doses. That is actually fun. (laughs) You can have the lessons without the learning firsthand. Uh, So that is my testament and testimony to picking up a work of fiction that drives home really fabulous leadership questions for you. So back to the ado, which I had undone, and that is to my guest, Ilias Canaris. So without further ado, really this time, let's get into it. Well, all the way from fabulous Auckland, New Zealand, welcome to the show, Elias Canaris. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to have a Kiwi on the show. It's been a while since we had a lovely Kiwi accent to grace our earbuds. What do I want to know is you've had an interesting background, an interesting journey all over the world. How did you get into this line of work? That's a great question, Zoe. I was born and raised in Libya, in North Africa. Really? And uh, yeah, my my mum was a teacher. My dad was a bank officer. And uh, what they taught me when I was growing up were a number of values. For example, I was taught about hard work, loyalty, honesty. And uh, in fact, I was the youngest of three siblings growing up. So when you're the youngest... You need to be heard and you're battling against those uh, older siblings. And I guess what I learned there led me towards leadership to be able to uh, be in amongst my uh, siblings, friends, and they're always older than me. And you've got to understand that leadership is part of that journey to get your voice heard and to get others to work with you. And that's what led me into the work that I'm now doing in terms of leadership development and growth uh, as a CEO. So being pummeled as the little brother <laughs> led you to being <laughs> wanting to understand influence of, as a leader. <laughs> Absolutely. I think John Maxwell always says leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And so I, to be uh, heard and stop being uh, pummeled all the time, absolutely, I had to influence people to to listen to this little runt uh, in the corner who's trying to you know grab hold of people's attention. But it's been a valuable tool that's uh, combined with that hard work, that honesty, that loyalty, ethic and values that my parents taught me. So how did you move from Libya and end up in New Zealand? Uh, Well, Libya was a great experience. And we were there um, born before uh, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, or Uncle Mo, as we like to call him, came to power. So when he came to power, obviously, uh, being a a non-Libyan, non-Arab, we had to leave. And my parents were Greek. So my dad's job took him to London. Uh, where we as a family emigrated, and I was really brought up in the UK, uh, started my uh, schooling, completed it there, started my career, uh, started my family. And then in 1995, after 25 years living in the UK, I decided to go and emigrate to New Zealand. And uh, this has been home for nearly three decades, and I absolutely love living here in New Zealand. So do you have a Kiwi accent or a British accent? I'm not sure now. <laughs> it's kind of a, bit of a mixture of both. Absolutely. I, I'm uh, what the Brits would call a Heinz 57 variety. So a mixture of everything all combined into one. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, I'm a bit like a bit the same. Born in England, grew up in Canada, ended up in Australia. A bit of a hodgepodge mixture, but pretty much Canadian still. But in amongst all your journey, so you Libya, UK, New Zealand, and had a really interesting experience with 9-11. And those of us who are older than, oh God, when was that, 2001, so 30, <laughs> will remember 11 quite significantly and where we were, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience of what happened to you during 
Well, to be honest, 9-11, it was just an ordinary Tuesday. I was at my parents' house in Wimbledon in South London, packing, preparing for my next part of my journey, which was to go from London Heathrow to Chicago. I was in the middle of an uh, international speaking tour. And I remember uh, that I woke up to a wardrobe malfunction. It turns out that I had failed to pack a tie. Now, you might say, Zoe, hold on a second. That's not really a wardrobe malfunction. But back then, um, you know, back in 2001, I was flying business class and you needed to be able to dress the part. So I ended up going uh, to the airport, having kissed my mum goodbye, hugged my dad as the taxi driver put my luggage into the back of the taxi. And my first port of call was to go to um, the tie rack where I purchased a, a new tie. And then I got onto the plane, worked my way through, worried about having to do a, um, a, a report that I was going to send back to the office. And honestly, I didn't realize that that day was going to be the most impactful day for not only myself, the 197 other passengers on United Airways UA929, but the thousands and millions around the world, as that day just so happened to be 9-11. And we were one of 38 aeroplanes that eventually was diverted to Gander in Newfoundland, Canada. And we end up spending a total of five days there until we were able to be released and sent back on our way to Chicago. Yeah, that's a long time. Like maybe people have been on flights before that have been diverted for an hour or two because of weather or whatever. Five days stuck in a tiny little inlet in Newfoundland. <laughs> and as a Canadian, like Newfies can be the butt of the Canadian jokes. You know, they're backward, they're inbred, et cetera. So Canadians say it's a tiny little place. So what was that like? You landed, you were diverted, you landed in this tiny town. What happened? Well, first of all, um, I've got to turn around and say, what did uh, Captain Mike Ballard, who was a pilot on UA929 do? The first thing he did before we diverted, he said, ladies and gentlemen, can I first reassure you there's nothing wrong with the aeroplane? However, there has been a significant incident in the USA and Federal Aviation Authority has shut down all airspace. We've been asked to divert. So when we landed, we knew that we were safe. But obviously, we had no idea what this major incident or significant incident was. First thought that went through my mind was that maybe somebody had assassinated the US president, followed by an even more sinister thought that possibly uh, somebody had dropped a, an atomic bomb on US soil. We ended up spending 24 hours in the aeroplane uh, waiting until they were able to disembark us and the other passengers, because you have to remember, Gander started that morning, 9,300 for breakfast. By the time 38 aeroplanes had landed, nearly 7,000 um, passengers and crew uh, came and descended on Gander. They had to cater for 16,000 people for supper. So we had to wait 24 hours, thinking initially, it's just going to be a short time. Uh, we were in denial, you know, we're going to be back up in the air. And then as the minutes ticked into hours, ticked into a full day, we suddenly realized that maybe, hey, to, uh, we weren't going to be going straight back home. There were 38 planes diverted to that little town. I didn't realize there were so many. That's a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And why there? <laughs> why that airport? Well, you, if you if you think about uh, the airport at, at uh, Ganda, it used to be the stopping off point between Europe and North America and Canada before jet engines were introduced. So they had to come and refuel there and continue their journey. So people like the Queen, um, the Beatles, Elvis, they all came through there in their time. Uh, but obviously now with jet engines, you can fly directly from Heathrow to Chicago. So it had a runway that was big enough to cater for that sort of uh, level of uh, of airplanes and uh, safe enough for us to divert quickly uh, with all these planes that were mid-flight. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. And there's been a whole Broadway show that's been produced on the back of this experience called Come From A Ways, <laughs> which is what the um, Atlantic Canadians call people who don't grow up 
thereabouts. You come from a ways. My parents who moved from Winnipeg to Prince Edward Island were also called CFAs or come from a ways. <laughs> they weren't from around there. What did you discover during those five days, five long days of not being able to leave this tiny little town and completely dependent on the generosity and, and hospitality of these Canadians? Well, when you take into consideration, as you rightly pointed out, their generosity, their hospitality, it gave us a, a juxtaposition against all of the tragedy that 9-11 caused with the two Twin Towers crashing, all the loss of life uh, as a result of those terrorist acts. But I probably learned three things as a result of being there. The first thing that I learned is you have to look after yourself first. It's okay to ask for help. And in a, in a situation like that where your world literally comes to a stop instantly, you've got to be able to figure out how do I cope with this? We've had 9-11. That's caused a lot of problems for us. People had to stop and readjust. And when you've got the mental health issues, we're probably a better equipped today to handle that, looking after yourself first. The second thing we learned was look after others. You have to expand your network and look after uh, people who are around you. And probably the third thing that I learned in that experience was it's time to change the rules. Whatever was valid before 9-11 was not necessarily valid going forward. So you had to be able to adapt and change the way that you behaved. And I think those three uh, lessons stood me so well of what I learned then and I'm applying still today. What do you mean by the last point that the rules of yesterday don't apply to what's next? Can you give me an example of that? Yeah, if I think about things, um, when I was there, um, you know, we had the transportation industry. Flights were grounded instantly. Uh, we had Things like um, tourism in New York City just evaporated overnight. Um, the speaking industry I was involved with closed down. Nobody was going to conferences, things along those lines. Now, when you have these situations, the rules will change. When we reestablished travel again, the way that we went through all the pre-checks and making sure that people were going through the airports and you segregated the travelers from the, their, their friends and visitors, the rules changed in the way that we operated the airports. The rules changed in terms of what you're allowed to take on board an aeroplane. So all the time, as things evolve, no matter what industry you're in, you're going to find that the rules will change. And an incident like 9-11 forced wholesale change. Incidents like uh, global financial crisis changed the way that we operated from a financial perspective. The way that COVID affected us has also changed the way that we as individuals operate. And as leaders, we have to understand that we have to lead our team through these changes. And sometimes the rules we operate to them prior to the event is no longer valid. And that's what I mean when I say change the rules. Okay. One of the things that you talk about in your work is how important uh, words are, language and communication is. Can you tell me a little bit about that? How do you suggest people work with language better? Is it part of this rule, new rule game, or is it something else entirely? Well, I, I think that uh, words are very, very important, especially the words that we share with ourselves. Uh, we get conditioned over time as we grow up to believe certain things about us, which is really, I, I suppose, almost imprinted on us through the words that people say about us and to us, especially when you're growing up. So as you yourself become uh, an adult, and you think about how you are talking to others, I think it's important for us to then manage the way that we communicate, not only with ourselves, but with other people. In fact, I came across a fascinating study that maybe some of your listeners would have heard about that came out in 2004 from uh, Dr. Masaru Emoto. Uh, and he created this experiment called, What the Bleep Do We Know?, and in this um, experiment, he took two jars of rice that he, he submerged in water. And on one jar, he put on the outside positive. And on the other jar, he put negative. 
And over the course of a month, he went through and started speaking to each jar, to the positive jar. He only said positive things, affirming things. To the negative jar, he just said negative words the whole way through. Now, at the end of the day, the jar with negative words started to grow mold, whereas the jar with positive words stayed clear. So I think, you know, whether you believe or not that you were to have an effect, I felt that was an amazing experiment that started to get me thinking about what am I saying? How do we say things? And how do they affect others around us? I love that whole um, that whole series of experiments where he did lots of other research around saying positive and negative words to water crystals and photographing them and their impact. Some of the research, following research, has debunked a little bit of it, but it doesn't matter because we know that words are weapons and if used incorrectly can be wielded to great detriment. You only have to talk to somebody about their childhood existing words they remember from their family or the wounds that, that words create, uh, such as you'll never amount to anything or you'll never be as successful as such and such, whatever it is. How do you suggest leaders use their words wisely? What are some recommendations you have for language in the hands of leaders? Well, uh, I think that uh, it all starts first by leading yourself first. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to uh, review what are we taking into ourselves? What are we listening to? What's the music we're listening to? What are the books we're reading? What are the podcasts? What are the films we're watching? If you are constantly enveloping yourself with things that are negative, eventually whatever you put in is going to come out. So I say to people, be very careful and choose wisely. Even choose wisely about the people that you associate with on a regular basis. Sometimes You have to look and review the relationships that you have and say, if somebody is constantly negative, maybe I remove them from my circle of influence, from my constant contact. And as you do this, get somebody that you can trust to give you feedback, maybe on a monthly basis, somebody who can mentor you and get them to uh, give you the feedback in terms of any blind spots that you might have. And at the end of the day, whilst we can see a certain amount ourselves, having a trusted advisor who can give us uh, that blind spot information becomes so powerful to help us ensure we consistently have only positive words coming out. Yeah, it's an interesting one uh, because there's also a danger that we filter out all the negative. We become a blind to the full reality of what's happening. So I suspect there's an additional strategy, which is look on evil, look on destruction and maintain your own and filters and make sure that you maintain your positivity in spite of or despite the situation which surrounds us. A component of that to be put on the table as well. What do you think, Elias? Look, for sure. I think that you've got to have a a well-balanced view of life. You can't sit there isolated and um, covered from everything that's happening out on the marketplace. So part of that, in my particular case, I have to be a man of faith. So I believe that uh, there are certain guidelines that uh, guide me towards my true north. Now, um, as a man of faith, I'm not trying to uh, force my faith over any of our listeners here, but I'd be unfair if I didn't reference what I'd learned through that journey about how we can listen to things and allow ourselves to have a balanced view. Now, just because we hear something doesn't mean that we have to accept it at face value. I think we should uh, apply a level of transparency to what is being received and give ourselves an ability to balance that out and make a judgment call. But I think too many people have been easy to respond and react, and especially keyboard warriors that we're seeing today online. They just uh, see one thing, they take it as uh, gospel, and then they just fire straight back, as opposed to being willing to listen, learn, educate themselves and say, hey, you might have a different view from me, and I accept that, so I gracefully decide to uh, have an alternative view that I can still cohabit alongside you, even though we've got 
distant and different viewpoints. It takes a huge level of emotional maturity and leadership maturity to stand at that that point and go, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and be accepting of all that. So yeah, it is, we have progress to make in that regard instead of, as you say, latching on to think that someone spouted and using that as a weapon to whack others with. It's, yeah, it's quite interesting. It takes all sorts of humans to create this kaleidoscope of experiences. And some of us are stuck for whatever reason in a place where we need to stir the pot, poke the bear, create a ruckus simply by being controversial. And as leaders, we want to be aware of that, open to it and be able to work with it because it's not necessarily disappearing around us. I like your approach to filtering out the negative, especially of our own thoughts and making sure that we work extensively to craft our own point of view, our own perspective and our own attitude. I like that very much, Elias. One of the people who seems to have inspired you a lot is Nelson Mandela. So can you tell me a little bit about what story that is hugely inspirational for you? What surprised you the most as you learned about his life and his work? Well, I think you, you talk about that whole ability as a leader to grow emotionally and mature the way that you behave and you think. If you take Nelson's story of being imprisoned and being isolated and for, for a crime, uh, you know, irrespective of what he did or didn't do, it's so easy when he was released after nearly 30 years in captivity and imprisonment to turn around and say, hey, I hate these people, what they've done to me, how they've treated me. And if he had not looked at a uh, willingness to forgive those people, South Africa could have been heading towards a real bloodbath. But Nelson Mandela was very deliberate as he was finally released uh, into freedom of turning around and creating a pathway that gave his nation a chance to reconcile and to heal. And to me, that willingness to forgive uh, reflects a, a lot of what I have within my faith. What I've been taught uh, through through my belief system about that ability to forgive others. And I think that when I look at it from the aspect of what we we're talking about earlier, Zoe, about how do we filter these negative comments, these negative thoughts, we've got to be able to forgive people present and past who have said things or are doing things that contradict with our value system. And if we spend all of our time just uh, harboring a, a grudge, then we will never go through. I think Nelson Mandela demonstrated that so clearly to me. And I wish I'd learned this probably 20 or 30 years earlier, because I think it would have helped me in my journey as a leader. It's quite transcendent to be able to forgive someone for transgressions. And incredibly challenging to do that. It's one of the ideas that in my first novel, The Olympus Project, are there things for which we cannot atone? <laughs> so forgiveness is the wounded person letting go of the trauma and the person who caused them harm. And then there's the aspect of the person who caused the harm. Can they ever do anything to make up for what happened? I think it's an interesting thing to explore. But there is more grace and forgiveness than there is in atonement, I feel. And if we practice more forgiveness, then we might be further along the leadership journey. You were to say something to that. Go ahead. Yeah, look, I, I definitely want to say something more. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Zoe. And I think that uh, I once heard, I can't remember, it was Skip Ross uh, who, who shared this wisdom probably about uh, uh, nearly three decades ago when I first heard this. He said that unforgiveness is like eating poison but expecting the other person to die. And to me, if we think about that, wow, uh, if you're harboring that unforgiveness, if you're constantly going back and being unwilling to forgive that person, you're causing more damage to yourself. And it's almost like those, the effects of the, the words and how they, they affected in those experiments that uh, Dr. Emoto did. We've got to be willing to forgive and realize that if we don't, we're the person that suffers the most. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I was in conversation with a group of people 
And we were kind of doing little thought experiments, you know, it's like, could you forgive so-and-so for what they've done? Could you forgive such and such for what they did? And, and I think we've kind of pushed the limit. And at a certain point, a few of us said, no, there's, I cannot forgive them for that. I think they're, what they've done is inexcusable and cannot be condoned. I think there's a difference between condoning an activity and forgiving the person for having committed the activity. Yeah, I think we could we could spin our wheels a little bit on this one, but there is a lot of grace in forgiveness or at least letting go of the attachment to the to the person and to the incident so that we can move on with our lives. And we may never forgive the act, but we may perhaps forgive the person, uh, seeing them as a tortured human in themselves, devoid of, of grace and guidance that's led them down such a terrible path. Maybe that's the frame I'm going to use in the future. Elias, you know, when I was talking to some friends and colleagues about, could you forgive such and such? Can you remember a time? And I love this question because it, it was a corollary, corollary to that conversation. When was the last time you changed your mind about something? What happened? <laughs> uh, where do you want me to start? I've, I've changed my mind so many times. And probably uh, when I reflect back on a great question like that, the last time I changed my mind about something was probably when I started something that I wasn't truly prepared for. Uh, I do like to uh, think through things and evaluate risk. So I will work my way through things. And uh, sometimes I, I don't take all the information and make a decision to go down a pathway. And I'll figure out quite quickly that I've made a mistake. So now I've learned over time that what I should do is trial, test and measure, and then adjust. So if I used to think the way I used to operate uh, a decade or two decades ago, I'd carry down a pathway and I'd go like a bull in a china shop and just work my way through until I caused so much damage that by the time I stopped and realized I had burnt a lot of bridges in that process. Today, I'm more cautious. I still am willing to take some risk, but after a short while, I'll stop, I'll pause, I'll measure. I'll see, am I still on the right trajectory? Is it worth pursuing further? Is it worth investing further? And sometimes I have to say, no, it's not. Stop this altogether. Other times I'll say, hey, adjust. Adjust the trajectory of where I'm going so I can help to accomplish more. But unless you have a good circle of influence or a good mentor who's able to help you along the journey and you talk to them and you trust them, you've got to have that ability to say, hey, is there somebody else out there? We mentioned blind spots uh, earlier on who can help us define those blind spots quickly, because it's so easy for us to continue down a pathway that is detrimental to all involved, unless we're willing to change our mind about something and be uh, educated to, to say, hey, there's an alternative, and this path will help us more. I like that. Adam Grand once said that you need to hold your ideas lightly. And I think that's a beautiful philosophy, you know, have an idea, hold it lightly so that you don't get too rusted on to an ocean and find it with new evidence and new feedback that mm, maybe that idea wasn't so useful in the end. Elias, are you ready for the fast five? I'll give it a go. Okay. What is the technology that you want the most right now? Crikey, if I was to think of a technology, I'd love to see a time machine. If the time machine was ever possible, I'd love to see that technology because I'd use it to go back in the time and fix my mistakes. But I also want to go into the future and see and understand what are the new trends coming out. I like that. And is there a particular period of history that you are most want to go back and see apart from your own life? Uh, I definitely want to go back to my own life, but I'd love to go back and look through the time around World War I, World War II. What caused that to happen? How did we learn from those experiences and how are we applying those leadership principles today so we can avoid those mistakes going forward? Mm, seems like we're not learning so much. Okay, good one. Um, number two, best tip you ever got for leadership? 
our best tip has to be walk slowly through the crowd. I love this. John Maxwell always talks about walking slowly through the crowd and making sure you give everybody attention uh, as opposed to rushing to do your work. Mm, I like that. That's nice. Number three, what's one problem in the workplace you'd love to wave a magic wand and be fixed right now? Well, um, I work within the contact center network in New Zealand. That's a, a membership-based association. When you think of contact centers, think about people who answer phones, deal with emails, web chats, etc. If there's one problem I want to fix, if there's too much abuse out there, there's people who call through who are so abusive to the agents. I'd love to create more empathy out there so people understand they're talking with real humans. And even though there might be a mistake on their account, we're trying our best to resolve it. Mm. Yes. Be nice to the people on the other end of the phone. Love it. Okay. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Your chance to give a yay or a boo to someone who's doing something dodgy. Well, I'll go for a yay. And I'll go for a yay, a yay right now for our prime minister here in New Zealand. Christopher Luxon has come in as a breath of fresh air for us business uh, leaders uh, he's treating our economy with the disciplines of a business as a CEO. So as a CEO myself, I know you've got to apply certain activities that will affect you from a fiscal perspective, from a governance perspective, as well as from a social uh, uh, outlook out there. And I think he's done that so well for us, even though he might have his haters out there. I think he's doing a great job. Hmm. Okay. It's not often prime ministers get a thumbs up. So there you go. And number five, what is your favorite leadership book or podcast, aside from this one, of course? <laughs> of course, uh, beside this one, I think from a book perspective, it'll be John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. In fact, it's just about any book John Maxwell produces I love. And podcasts, I'd have to say, Leadership is Changing by Dennis Giannoutsos is, again, very refreshing review on what's happening in leadership today. Mm, okay, love it. Thank you so much. That was The Fast Five. The Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Amplifiers Academy. It is an online self-paced leadership development program that you can join at any time and progress at your pace. There are very short video lessons, great checklists and resources and recommendations and book summaries all there to help boost your leadership thinking and abilities. We focus on leading strategy, leading culture, leading change, and leading performance. So if you want a go-to resource that can help boost your strategic abilities immediately, check us out, Amplifiers Academy, on the zoerouth.com website. See you there. Elias, what's a question I haven't asked that you'd love to answer? The question you haven't asked is, uh, I guess, oh, a great question. To me, I think the question is, what do we have to do to balance the wrongs over time? So if we think about this from an Indigenous perspective, whether it's here in uh, New Zealand, across in Australia, uh, I think that we have to go back and say, hey, if we've made mistakes, how do we as leaders accept responsibility for somebody else's failings? And that's a question I wish you asked, but I don't think I have the necessarily the right answer for. I think that's a good guiding question, though. How might we right the wrongs of the past? It's... um. It calls you think bigger than our immediate uh, surroundings. I love it. Elias, that's been fantastic. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, probably the best place to get hold of me is via LinkedIn. Uh, Elias Canaris is an unusual name and relatively unique. So uh, if you go and look for me on LinkedIn, that's the best way to get hold of me and the best way to connect. Thank you so much for sharing your insight, Elias. This has been really delightful. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it was lovely to connect with Elias. The takeaway for me is really mulling over the power of forgiveness and practicing exercising that muscle, you know, and really trying to separate the human being from the deed that they've done. And if it's possible to do that, I think it's always an exercise of courage and of heart to explore that 
can we forgive the human being who was once a baby, someone's precious child, and for whatever things that have happened to them in their life, they've morphed into something that is less than honorable, perhaps, in their deeds. Can we forgive them for their transgressions? I like that as an exercise of heart. In terms of tip of the week, this one comes from my second book, Moments, Leadership When It Matters Most. And one of the chapters is about ethical challenges. And this is the story of 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai, who boarded a bus on the school in Swat, a northwest district of Pakistan. You may recall this story. A gunman stopped the bus, asked for her by name, and fired at point-blank range. One bullet went through the left side of Malala's forehead, traveled under her skin, and landed in her shoulder. The other bullets hit two other girls in the bus in the hand and shoulders. Both survived. Malala survived also, and she became a campaigner for girls' and women's educational rights. And in a speech in July 2013, at, in an audience to Queen Elizabeth II at the United Nations, she called for worldwide access to education. And she says, The terrorists thought they would change my aims and stop my ambitions, but nothing changed in my life except this. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. I'm not against anyone. Neither am I here to speak in terms of personal revenge against the Taliban or any other terrorist group. I'm here to speak up for the right of education for every child. I want education for the sons and daughters of the Taliban and all terrorists and extremists. If that is not a model for forgiveness and positive focus, then I don't know what is. So I think there is hope for all of us to have this kind of courage and and power in our focus. Up next on the show, we have a solo sode with yours truly. Stay tuned for deep insights on my latest musings and reflections and readings. A reminder too that my program Grace Under Fire will be kicking off shortly in July. I'd love for you to be part of it. It's about how to develop that great inner personal resilience and fortitude to handle any moment, no matter how challenging the circumstances. In the meantime, I'd love for you to live with grace and lead in service. And that means live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast. To find out more about leadership of the future or to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com. 